Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or a short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. May I know your problem? Well, I have headache. The headache first began two months ago. I feel a sensation of pressure. The intensity is moderately severe, making regular activities difficult. I fear I am getting much closer to sinus congestion, or maybe photophobia. What's your age? Forty-two, doctor. Do you drink or smoke? Well, I do not smoke but I drink regularly. Tell me if any of your family members have any history of illness. My father and brother have a history of migraine, doctor. Is there any congestion in your chest or throat? Yes, I have some sinus congestion. Did you have any cardiovascular problems? No, doctor. Any gastrointestinal problems in the past or present? No, doctor. Are you taking any medications? No, doctor. Are you allergic to any medicine? Yes, codeine. Do you have any muscle cramps, joint pain, back pain, or limb pain? No, doctor. Do you have any musculoskeletal problems, or in the past? No, doctor. Well, the sense of smell of your cranial nerves was intact. Neck range of motion was normal in all directions. There was no evidence of cervical muscle spasm. No radicular symptoms were elicited by neck motions. Shoulder range of motion was bilaterally normal. There were no areas of tenderness. Tests of neurovascular compression were negative. There were no carotid brutes. Back range of motion was normal in all directions. Position and vibratory sense was normal. Your gait has no abnormal components. Tandem gait was performed normally. There is no edemia or significant variscosities. You have developed migraine without aura. I am going to describe therapeutic trial of Indorol, 40 mg, half tablet twice a day for one week, then one tablet twice a day for the next week, and then for the third week, one tablet thrice a day. Continue these medications for three weeks and meet me again after three weeks. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or a short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. Please, be seated. May I know your problem? Well, I feel that I have jaundice and a pancreatic mass. And recently I've noticed a new murmur, bacteremia, and fever. What's your age? Sixty-four, doctor. Okay. Do you have a cardiac history, or else any shortness of breath called orthopnea? or attacks of severe shortness of breath and coughing at night called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea? No, doctor. Are you getting chest pain, palpitations, or syncope? No, doctor. You have any past medical history? 
I had diabetes, hypertension, and transient ischemic attack long back. Okay. What medications are you taking? Acidophilus supplement, cholesteramine, Creon 20 three times daily, Diovan 160 milligrams twice daily, Lantus 10 daily, Norvasc 5 milligrams daily, Novolog 7030, 10 units at noon daily, Pamelor 15 milliliters every evening, Vitamin D3 one tablet weekly. Are you allergic to any medication? I'm allergic to codeine, Coreg, and vancomycin. Is there any family history of illness? Well, my daughter has a history of a murmur. My father died when he was 75 due to chronic heart failure. Okay. Well, your laboratory data shows sodium-133, potassium-2.8, chloride-99, bicarbonate-31, glucose-75, BUN-12, creatinine-0.8, calcium-8.6, total bilirubin-3.2, AST-63, and ALT-43, white count-5.4, hemoglobin-9.1, hematocrit-26.6, and platelet count-128,000, lipase less than 10. Your abdomen CT diagnosis shows a pancreatic mass with biliary obstruction. Previous biliary stent is present. Your electrocardiogram shows normal sinus rhythm. There are no acute ST-T changes. Your temperature is 98.8, heart rate 96, sinus, blood pressure 138 over 55, respiratory rate 20, and oxygen saturation 92%. You have newly developed murmur that has occurred in the setting of fever and bacteremia. You also have a pancreatic mass with jaundice, hypertension, hyponatremia, and hypokalemia. Take Diavan and Norvasc for blood pressure control. I recommend that you should undergo an echocardiogram. This will be to assess the possibility of endocarditis which may be contributing to these symptoms. That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the text, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you will hear people talking in different healthcare settings. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now, look at question 25. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of kidney cancer cells? Well, there are about 10 different types of kidney cancer cells. Clear cell is very common type of cell found in about 70% of kidney cancers, which may be slow growing or grade 1 and less aggressive, or may be grade 4 with a very aggressive growth. Clear cells are susceptible to treatment with immunotherapy and targeted therapy. Papillary cancer cells is seen in 10% to 15% of patients and has further subtypes called type 1 and type 2. Sarcomatoid cells grow most aggressively of all types of kidney cancer cells. It may be found with clear cell or papillary type. The cancer cells appear like sarcoma cells under the microscope. Collecting duct cancer is similar to transitional cell carcinoma and is rare and is usually treated with chemotherapy. Oncocytoma is a slow-growing cancer and does not spread beyond the kidneys. Chromophobe is another type of rare cancer. Angiomyolipoma 
is a non-cancerous tumor that has a unique appearance on the computed tomography scan. This type of cancer is less likely to grow aggressively and spread and is treated surgically. Question 26. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. What is fibrosis, and what are the different types of fibrosis? Well, the term fibrosis means the formation of fibrous tissue that may or may not be connected with tissue healing. Some of the different types of fibrosis are lung fibrosis or pulmonary fibrosis may occur as a result of prolonged infections, such as tuberculosis or pneumonia. The condition is also caused by exposure to occupational hazards such as coal dust or the genetic condition called cystic fibrosis. Liver fibrosis or cirrhosis refers to the scar tissue and nodules that replace liver tissue and disrupt liver function. The condition is usually caused due to alcoholism, fatty liver disease, and hepatitis B or hepatitis C. Heart fibrosis affects the regions of the heart that have become damaged due to myocardial infarction may undergo fibrosis. Mediastinal fibrosis is characterized by calcified fibrosis of the lymph nodes that can block respiratory channels and blood vessels. Retroperitoneal cavity fibrosis affects the soft tissue in the retroperitoneum, which contains the aorta, kidneys, and numerous other structures. Bone marrow fibrosis, or myelofibrosis, is scarring in the bone marrow that prevents the normal production of blood cells in the bone marrow. Skin fibrosis is the scar tissue that forms on the skin in response to injury, called a keloid. Scleroderma, or cystic sclerosis, is an autoimmune disease of the connective tissue that initially affects the skin but also involves other organs such as the kidneys, heart, and lungs. Question 27. Now, read the question. Doctor, what is an autophagy, and what are the types? Well, autophagy is a process which includes the consumption of the body's own tissue during a metabolic process that occurs due to starvation and in certain diseases. The different types of autophagy are Macroautophagy processes involves delivery of cytoplasmic cargo to the lysosome through the intermediary of a double membrane bound vesicle, which is called an autophagosome, that fuses with the lysosome to form an autolysosome. Microautophagy. During this process, the cytosolic components are directly consumed by the lysosome itself through the lysosomal membrane. Chaperone-mediated autophagy. During this process, the targeted proteins are translocated across the lysosomal membrane in a complex with chaperone proteins. Question 28. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. What is the role of epinephrine in our body? Well, triggering fight or flight response is the role of epinephrine in our body. This occurs when a person is subject to a threat which causes a signaling process to occur, leading to our reaction to the potential danger. Epinephrine and liver cells. 
one of the places where epinephrine has an effect is in the liver. Epinephrine, along with another hormone called glucagon, is responsible for the breakdown of glycogen in liver cells. Epinephrine and the lungs. The lungs contain smooth muscle. Epinephrine causes smooth muscles to relax. Specifically, epinephrine binds to beta-2 adrenergic receptors on bronchial muscle cells. Epinephrine and the skin. The effect of epinephrine on the skin is mainly caused by it binding to alpha-adrenergic receptors, the alpha-2 adrenergic receptor in particular. Epinephrine and the heart. Epinephrine binds to beta-adrenergic receptors on heart muscle cells. This causes the contraction rate of the heart to increase. This ultimately leads to increased blood supply to the tissues in the body. Question 29. Now, read the question. Ringworm, or tinea, or dermatophytosis, is a common skin and nail infection caused by fungus. Because the disease causes an itchy, red, circular rash, the disease is called ringworm. The different types of ringworm are usually named for the location of the infection in the body. Areas of the body parts that can be affected by ringworm are tinea pedis infects the feet, which is also called athlete's foot. Tinea cruris infects inner thighs, groin, or buttocks, which is also called jock itch. Tinea capitis infects the scalp, and tinea barbe infects the beard. Tinea manuum cause infections in hands. Tinea unguium or onychomycosis, infects fingernails and toenails or fingernails. Tinea corporis infects other body parts such as legs and arms. Question 30. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. What are different types of humanoid arthritis? Knowing the exact type of rheumatoid arthritis will be very helpful to provide an appropriate treatment to the patient. Types of rheumatoid arthritis include if a patient has seropositive rheumatoid arthritis, the blood test result would show a positive rheumatoid factor. This means the patient has the antibodies that cause the immune system to attack the joints. Juvenile idiopathic arthritis refers to rheumatoid arthritis in people younger than 17 years of age. The condition was previously known as juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. The symptoms are the same as those of other types of rheumatoid arthritis, however, they may also include eye inflammation and issues with physical development. If the patient has a seronegative rheumatoid arthritis, the blood test would show a negative rheumatoid factor and a negative anticyclic citrullinated peptide. But if the patient still has rheumatoid arthritis symptoms, it may be probably a seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. The patient may eventually develop antibodies, changing the diagnosis to seropositive rheumatoid arthritis. That is the end of part B. Now, look at part C. Part C. In this part of the text, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. 
Complete the answers as you listen. Now, look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Hello everyone, I am going to explain to you migraines and headaches. If you've given much consideration to the factors that might encompass the different types of migraine and headaches, you probably imagine that they range from a dull throb that doesn't require any treatment to excruciating pain that would require a trip to the emergency room. But do you know that there are about 16 different classifications involving migraine and headaches? Interestingly, some of them don't even involve head pain at all. Here's a rundown of various types of migraine and headaches. An abdominal migraine is mainly in children of 5 to 9 years old. However, it can occur in adults as well. This type of migraine usually doesn't involve a headache although children with abdominal migraines often have head pain when they grow older. Acephalgic or silent migraine has many migraine symptoms but without headache. Alice in Wonderland syndrome is a rare form of migraine aura that causes distortions in perception. Patients with Alice in Wonderland syndrome might feel as if they are growing smaller than larger or might find time seeming to speed up or slow down. Usually, children experience this condition more than adults. However, it can occur in people of any age. Symptoms of a basilar-type migraine can be confused with those of a stroke at times. This condition can cause speech slurring, unsteadiness, vertigo, and numbness. This type of a migraine isn't common but one study showed it may occur in up to 10% of those who have a migraine with aura. If the headache occurs for more than 15 times a month, means it's a chronic daily headache. About 4% to 5% of people have chronic daily headache, which falls into numerous subcategories based on the characteristics of the headache. A chronic daily headache will have symptoms like snore and sleep problems. Cluster headaches are the most painful headache type that involve attacks of severe pain lasting between 15 and 180 minutes. This can occur once every other day or even up to eight times in a day. Cluster headaches are diagnosed more often in men than in women. Hemicrania continua is a headache that doesn't stop that occurs on one side of the head. Pain is moderate but can spike into excruciating at times. Hemicrania continua is not considered a migraine, but can share some symptoms with a migraine, including light sensitivity and nausea. However, the condition can be easily treated with a particular form of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. 
A hemiplegic migraine is a rare form of a migraine where the patient experiences weakness on one side of the body, possibly accompanied by confusion or speech slurring. Ice pick headaches are stabbing, extremely intense headaches that can be absolutely terrifying. The condition generally lasts from 5 to 30 seconds. However, they can strike anywhere on the head, sensing as if an ice pick is being stuck in the head. New daily persistent headache is diagnosed with daily head pain that persists for three months or more. To diagnose this type of headache, the doctor must first rule out several other conditions that can cause similar symptoms. Pseudotumor cerebri or idiopathic intracranial hypertension is a condition in which the body either produces too much of the fluid found in the brain and spine or doesn't absorb the fluid properly. Pseudotumor cerebri means false brain tumor because the symptoms of this condition mimic a brain tumor. A retinal migraine causes flashes or sparkles of light possibly combined with partial or complete temporary blindness, but only in one eye. This occurs before the headache phase of a migraine starts. The head pain generally commences within an hour of such visual symptoms and lasts up to three days. A transformed migraine starts as chronic migraine attacks, however, gradually or quickly transforms into almost daily and less severe head pain. Transformed migraine attacks can be accompanied by nausea, along with sensitivity to sound and light. Status migrainosis is a painful, debilitating migraine attack that lasts for more than 72 hours. However, in case moderate to severe migraine pain lasts for more than 72 hours with less than a solid 4-hour pain-free period while awake, it should be treated as an emergency. A tension-type headache is the most common form of headache, affecting about 80% of people, which is often called a band around the head. In this condition, one will have mild to moderate pain that can be alleviated with over-the-counter pain relievers. Now look at extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello, doctor. What is an acanthamoeba infection, and what are its types? Acanthamoeba is a genus of opportunistic protozoan, amoebic species widely found in the environment. Moreover, it is part of a broader family of free-living amoebae that can autonomously survive in the environment. However, it can also parasitize in humans and result in severe infections. 
Having discovered as a contaminant of yeast culture in 1930, it has become increasingly appreciated in the past few decades due to its potential to cause diseases in persons wearing contact lenses and immunocompromised persons, and also for its capability to act as a reservoir for various pathogens such as fungi, bacteria, and viruses. Three major classifications of rare clinical syndromes can be caused by acanthamoeba. A fatal granulomatous amoebic encephalitis that involves the spinal cord and brain. Acanthamoeba keratitis that involves the eye and disseminated infection that often manifests in many skin lesions. Granulomatous amoebic encephalitis. Initially, the term granulomatous amoebic encephalitis was coined mainly to define the brain infection caused by acanthamoeba species. Nevertheless, the other free-living amoebae, especially Balamuthia, Mandrillaris, and Sapina diploidea, can result in analogous clinical presentation. Most often, acanthamoeba affects the posterior structures of the brain in patients' diseases such as diabetes, renal failure, various malignancies, systemic lupus erythematosus, and human immunodeficiency virus. Other predisposing factors are organ transplantation, drug abuse, alcoholism, radiotherapy, or chemotherapy. It is often very cumbersome for the early clinical diagnosis of this condition as symptoms mimic ischemic stroke or some other type of infectious encephalitis. In this condition, the disease usually manifests with headache, confusion, stiff neck, fever, lethargy, and focal neurologic deficits. As the infection becomes severe, the signs of raised intracranial pressure predominate resulting in coma and mortality. Acanthamoeba keratitis represents a multifactorial process connected with the use of contact lenses. It can also occur in non-contact lens users, especially those with low levels of immunoglobulin A antibodies in their tear film or changes in the surface of the cornea. The process begins with the disintegration of the epithelial barrier and stromal invasion by acanthamoeba that induces a vigorous inflammatory response and subsequent stromal necrosis with potential blinding. There is also a chance of bacterial superinfection that further complicates timely diagnosis. Usually, the symptoms are restricted to one eye and include swelling, pain, redness, tearing, light sensitivity or photophobia, abnormal contraction of the eyelid called blepharospasm, and blurred vision when the corneal lesion involves the visual axis. Disseminated infection and skin lesions. If acanthamoeba enters the skin through the nostrils or a wound, the organism can travel through the bloodstream, spread to other organs, and result in a disseminated infection. In such cases, the clinical process can be fulminant with swift progression to death. Infection with acanthamoeba species can also result in various skin lesions that usually start as firm papules nodules, subsequently developing into indurated ulcerations. Yet, it is unclear whether such skin manifestations arise as a primary focus of infection or as a result of hematogenous spread from other sites. If they are diagnosed microscopically, the cutaneous lesions are often characterized by focal necrosis surrounded by inflammatory cells, vasculitis, and amoebas themselves. Even then, the condition can be confused with other infection caused by fungi, viruses, or mycobacteria, especially if the organism is not visualized in the single biopsy specimen. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.
that is the end of this listening test. Thank you very much for practicing this test with Lifestyle Training Center. You can now check in the description and verify your answers. If you find this video helpful, please subscribe to our channel and write down your comments and let us know how you feel about it. If you need more help or for training, please feel free to contact us. Details can be found in the description. Until we see you next time, take care. Bye-bye.